So, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to this panel today. Sorry for the delay. Um, today, th this is the fourth panel of uh, RIT Research Institute on Turkey. Um, I'd like to give a very brief introduction on, on the Research Institute. We are a group of um, uh, activists, scientists, um, uh, academicians, uh, artists um, that uh, came together at the beginning of the year. Oh, okay, that's fine. So I, uh, I came together at the beginning of the year. The main focus of the Institute and our research uh, is on colonization practices. And in Left Forum uh, this weekend, uh, this is the fourth panel. We previously uh, uh, discussed on uh, commons practices and Turkey, uh, communizing academia for open knowledge and communizing the collective memory. And today, this, the fourth panel is uh, focusing on colonizing urban spaces against neoliberal urbanization. Uh, we had two speakers. I originally it was three, but one had to drop down. So um, Esra Akcan is uh, with us here today. Um, her talk, the title of her talk is Tactical or Uncritical Urbanism, a Revisit of the Housing Question. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Architecture at Cornell University here. Uh, she taught history, theory classes, and architectural design studios at uh, various places, including the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, Humboldt University in Berlin, Columbia University, New School, and Pratt Institute, and Middle East Technical University in Ankara, in Turkey. Uh, she's author of several books, including The Architecture and Translation, uh, published in 2012, and uh, Turkey Modern Architectures in History, um, uh, published in 2012. Um, and our second speaker uh, will be Emre Çetingar. He's going to probably be connecting us via uh, Skype. And then I'm, I'll introduce him then. Now, um, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. It's good. it's good. Okay, great. Um, so, um, more than a century after Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels identified the housing question as an intrinsic crisis of capitalist societies, the lack of affordable and sustainable housing still remains as one of the biggest challenges of world cities today. Marx and Engels' analysis was bitterly clear. A society obsessed with private property and surplus values will never be able to provide decent living conditions for segments of the population whose exploitation it relies on in the first place. Approximately a century later, the United Nations exposed that almost a billion people of the world's population live in illegal housing, in an environment out of social contract, without adequate infrastructure, waste collecting or public services. There must be around 200,000 slums in mega cities around the world, some of which have populations as high as 4 million, namely bigger than many US cities. Mike Davis has named the environment made out of the global capital at the dawn of the 21st century as a planet of slums. And until recently, Turkey has also been featured at the tops of these lists that documented these numbers. So the housing question has never been as urgent as today. Yet, paradoxically, it has never been as absent from architectural or governmental or any other professional concern as of today. So in this panel, we are here to ask if the concept of the commons, as distinct from the concept of the private and the public, can have any contribution to affordable and sustainable housing around the world today. Can we talk about something called a common housing or housing of the commons as a third a distinct category different from the public and private housing. But before we get carried away with the charms of this idea, I would like to alert us to two convenient myths that may indeed block us from thinking realistically and fairly about this alternative. The first myth is the stigma of public housing. One obstacle for housing activism today is indeed the perceived failure or the uncreativity of public housing. This myth has been created by such events as the destruction of crude Igo housing, which has put the blame on the modernist public housing designs and the residents who lived in it, 
rather than placing the event in the context of broader global economic dynamics and the shrinking ex-industrial cities. This stigma of public housing has gone hand in hand with the disappearance of affordable housing from the disciplinary definition of architecture. So I'm an architect and I teach in an architecture school. If I had a penny each time I heard that public housing is not within the definition of architecture with a capital A, or if I had a penny every time I heard that the students need not learn public housing as these constitute the worst examples in history, I could have sponsored perhaps a public housing myself. So this appro approach is indeed historically inaccurate. Far from being a task outside of architecture, most of the architectural principles now appreciated as modernism, such as efficiency, rationalization, functionalism, responsible use of natural materials, were indeed created when early to mid 20th century architects were designing public housing. The perceived homogeneity and normativity of public housing is not also that true. If one looked closely to world examples, rather than just one type of public housing, if one looked closely to many world examples, one could hardly flatten out the irreducible differences between housing of, let's say, Weimar <coughs> Germany and the Red Vienna program, or Hassan Fatih's housing in Egypt, and those housing in Zonguldak, Turkey, or garden cities of Britain, and those of Japan and France, the Plattenbau blocks of Eastern Europe, and unit habitation of Western Europe, the Stalin Ale uh, housing uh, in East Berlin, or um, the participatory housing, and so on. So there has been no shortage of um, differences in public housing. So what we are discussing today, common housing, or housings of the commons, if there could be such a thing, will be by definition different from public housing, trying to undo some of its state-controlled normative and disciplinary attributes. Not all pu public housing has been architecturally cre uh, creative, and it has been normative and um, it has had normative and disciplinary attributes, and this is a fair criticism, I think. And I'll exemplify some of these housing uh, with the recent practices of the AK Party government in Turkey. Uh, so, however, it would be unwise to erase the know-how that emerged from the successful examples of public housing. And it would indeed be facile to claim the superiority of any other housing by continuing the same myth about public housing stigma. Namely, this myth about the public housing's failure has been produced for the convenience of privatization and neoliberalism. So it would be uh, unwise to continue that myth. So the second myth that I would like to alert us to is the perceived criticality of what has been named and recently revived as tactical urbanism. And this is a term taking its inspiration from Michel de Certeau, who differentiated uh, between a state's top-down official strategies and the citizens' bottom-up everyday life tactics that emerged as they appropriated their urban spaces. The complex history of squatting and unofficial housing in Turkey has a global relevance in this context, as it has been suggested as an example of tactical urbanism, as an example of bottom-up urbanization. So the rural immigrants who left their villages after the 1950s in Turkey and who neither had the financial resources for available urban dwellings nor the professional expertise for well-paid urban jobs had little choice but to squat lands and construct their own houses illegally. These came to be known as gece kondus, namely houses built by squatting on lands that either belonged to the state or to others which required court order to demolish and could thus be occupied for an indefinitely temporary period of time. While unofficial urban growth is common among many non-Western countries, the squatter housing in Turkey must be explained by also taking into account the residues of the Ottoman Empire's land policies. During much of the classical period, farmers could cultivate the state land for agricultural purposes, but they could not claim it as their private property. Almost all land belonged to the state. Land, in other words, was hardly conceived as a commodity for private ownership. This situation basically continued during the 19th century modernization, and the size of the state property increased further when the non-Muslim population was either massacred or forced to emigration between 1915 and 25, resulting in a de facto transfer of their land to state. Until very recently, two-thirds of Turkey's territory still belong to the state. Uh, 
which is a very high number, a situation that only changed with the neoliberalization after 1983. So the scarcity of private property or the fact that land was not necessarily conceived as a commodity to buy, um, this situation could in fact have been turned into an opportunity for affordable housing. One of the major different difficulties of public housing in Western Europe and North American countries has been to provide cheap land for residential use, which could have been less of an issue in Turkey, since the state uh, could have allocated this land for the welfare of low-income groups. However, the Turkish governments did not do this, um, and they did not open access of this land to legal urban development either. Instead, the unclaimed land was occupied by the squatter settlements. And some commentators have indeed considered this phenomenon as some sort of a tactic, something that grows bottom up. Um, or one might even say commonized housing, given that the land these houses were built on were uh, public or common. But I would like to ask, can we really consider squatted housing environments as a superior alternative to public housing? A quick historical overview might be helpful to see how this deceptively tactical urbanism or housing on commonized land was indeed either convenient or co-opted into the dominant state system. So let me go over a very quick overview. So the first uh, squatter settlements of Turkey were constructed as early as 1940s in Ankara, Istanbul and relatively later in Izmir. According to official calculations, during the early 1960s, 60% 60 of Ankara's population resided in squatter settlements, more than 50%. So 53 in Erzincan, 45 in Istanbul and Adana, 34 of Izmir's. These settlements were officially defined in 1966 in Turkish law as buildings erected against the legal planning and building construction regulations. So these single-story houses were built rapidly, um, these are some very early pictures of them, using ad hoc materials in the surroundings. They were additive, uh, namely they were originally built in one night as one to two room shelters, but um, they became larger as new members of the family migrated. Adobe, wood, or if available stone were used for walls, oil cloth or tin plate covered the roofs and the floors were left exposed without a slab. As the houses expanded, residents used more durable materials that were locally manufactured, such as brick and metals. In time, settlers built grocery stores, coffee houses, barber shops, turning the settlements into semi-sufficient neighborhoods, and they even built real estate offices so that settlers coming from similar regions agglomerated in the same settlements to benefit from the solidarity of their hometown dwellers. Uh, one of the biggest problems in these areas, as well as their biggest toll on cities, was their environmental and sanitation problems due to the lack of infrastructure and public municipal services, including the sewage system, water management, waste collecting, transportation, electricity, drainage of rainwater. And child and the state policy towards these areas stayed ambiguous between 1945 and 80, swinging between demolishment and legalization. With the law of 1948, Ankara was entitled to deliver land to residents living in squatter houses to put an end to illegal development. The law of 1953, which stayed effective till 66, legalized previously built houses, but also authorized municipalities to demolish further settlements. The five-year development plans of 1960s and 70s suggested that settlements be destroyed only after the proper replacement of residents. Throughout the 1970s, there were several armed battles between squatter residents and state officials over the demolishment of their houses. Meanwhile, copious amnesty laws, Afyasasa of 1953, 1963, 66, 76, legalized the previously illegal houses in some neighborhoods. It has not escaped the public that these amnesty laws were granted especially before the elections and the political parties used uh, squatter legalization as a campaign tool. So how did this happen? Were the forces of history so unavoidable that half of the urban residents lived in illegal houses across Turkey? How come Turkish governments could not or did not prevent squatting? Was the state helpless in the face of rapid modernization and urbanization or did it support tactical urbanism? Or rather, did the state turn a blind eye to squatter 
impacts, long-term impacts, so as to allocate the country's resources elsewhere. For example, during this period, public housing funds were used for the benefit of upper and middle income groups for the cooperative uh, housing, rather than the benefit of the rural immigrants. According to Ilhan Tekeli, as self-built solutions to workers' housing, squatters not only provided cheap labor for the industry, but also decreased the amount of resources to be allocated for urbanization. Namely, squatters, which was a problem from an urban planner's viewpoint, was a solution from the viewpoint of the capitalists. So this history took a slightly different turn uh, when with Turkey's participation in the neoliberal world economy in the 1980s where governments rushed to open state land to privatization. As I mentioned before, uh, neoliberalization, two-thirds of the territory belonged to the state, and after 1980s, there was a rush to private privatization of land. A series of amnesty laws after 1980 broadened the legalization uh, policies of the previous governments. For instance, the amnesty law of 1984 made it much easier for settlers to apply for license. Those who owned more than one squatter house could claim rights to legalization, and this made it effortless for the entrepreneurial spirit of the squatter profiteers to take advantage of the authorization process. Another significant dis, uh, difference of the amnesty laws was their transformative effect on the city fabric, changing it from low-rise, irregular, ad hoc houses to large anonymous apartment blocks. Up to four-story high buildings could now be constructed on the existing irregular fabric of the previously squatted areas, making amnesty law no longer a public aid for the urban poor who had self-built their shelters, but a new urban development strategy. This urban development strategy was named as Rehabilitative Master Plan, Islah Imar Pilone, and this strategy drastically changed the physical environment and opened squatter zones to unprecedented real estate investment. So the age when a single family could inhabit a common land and self-built an improvised house out of ad hoc materials in one night was over. Instead, apartment buildings with minimal city services, improper infrastructure and inappropriate sanitation measures and constructed out of concrete without adhering to structural regulations in high-risk earthquake zones proliferated. In an era of uncertainty, where future could bring either new permissions for buildings or court orders to destroy them, the materials and construction methods did not reflect decisions for long-term use. For example, developers left steel bars jutting out of the reinforced concrete columns for a possible extension to the upper floor, regardless of the fact that this made the buildings even more vulnerable to earthquake. In an area without a predetermined plan, Multiple lane asphalt roads, uh, roads uh, could be connected to unfinished dirt pathways. Some of the infrastructure that carried the municipal services to semi-legal buildings were constructed after the fact, so electrical wires, sets of pipelines, ducts, uh, uh, lied on the street waiting to be built. In brief, perpetuation of the incomplete and lack of faith in the formal characterized the built environment of this shady real estate. Commentators have offered split explanations on squatter settlements in Turkey, interpreting them either as urban wounds or popular wisdom, either as unmodern growth or tactical urbanism. It seems to me that in a country where the right to the city was perceived to be handed over to the citizens by the state, the subsequent government used their authority to grant land ownership and legality in quite opportunistic ways. The illegal housing, turned out to be quite convenient for the state institutions that presumed to define legality. Tactical urbanism or housing on commonized land served as a convenient tool for the dominant system throughout the second half of the 20th century. And with the rise of the AK Party government, the his this history took yet another turn. By a series of laws that passed after 2003, the AK Party government delivered unprecedented powers to Toki, the infamous Toki. Paradoxically, or perhaps quite strategically, Toki inherited its name and mission from the public housing tradition in Turkey, but changed the definition of public housing and its financial structure. Toki is now allowed to give credit and collaborate with individuals and private companies, thereby privatizing the public housing sector as an extension of neoliberal economies. Toki also changed the definition of public housing to enable the construction of larger and bigger units for better income families, for second properties, 
for even vacation houses, housing. And regulations built between 2003 and 8 gave Turkey record financial benefits and legal power to build profitably on state-owned land. In not more than five years, 66 million square meters of land were transferred to Turkey, which built 500,000 housing units, or which hardly were committed to public housing as part of an architectural discipline, or hardly any explored creative ways to improve the quality of life and space. One of the fastest growing new residential type has been the sprawling high rises of 12 to 24 stories, often built with generic plants and prefabricated techniques. And one of Turkey's major activities has been the squatter clearance, which the institution sees as part of the United Nations Habitat Mission. A series of regulations in 2004 and 5 made squatter construction a crime and gave municipalities rights to allocate squatter settlements as renewal zones and to re relocate the settlers, usually by buying their underpriced property and selling them state-built mass housing units with unduly high mortgage prices. Under this rubric, colossal areas with a total of 12,000 buildings were destructed between 2003 and 11, and massive numbers of settlers were relocated in state-built mass housing, usually miles away from their original neighborhoods and comprised of smaller units, and this process legitimately caused a lot of social unrest. So the profitable lands uh, with convenient locations and beautiful views of the squatter settlements were then opened for luxury real estate. So the AK Party government thus manipulated a century-long architectural tradition for public housing and turned it, turned it into a neoliberal tool. In this context, it is alarming to see how the idea of tactical urbanism has been revived again, now with a new face and a band-aid solution that is not critical but complicit with the state policies. The entry on Istanbul in the recent exhibition called Tactical Urbanism is a case in point. So this exhibition brought together six collaborative projects, each undertaken in one mega city, and Istanbul was one of them, which exemplified a tactical ur urbanism. The exhibition actually had uh, a very um, subversive aim. Uh, so to initiate a change in neoliberal urban practices, the exhibition's curators and participants called architects to an activist engagement with the world cities and to a more critical stance against the ruling system. For instance, David Harvey, who wrote in the catalog, uh, um, followed his line of thought in his book, Rebel Cities, and he mentioned urban uh, Istanbul's Gezi events uh, in this catalog as evidence of the rising discontent with urban inequality in global cities. The exhibition had this kind of aim. However, uh, the project for Istanbul in the very same exhibit is quite complicit with the governmental interventions in Turkey, rather than being critical of or activists against the government's policies that sparked the Gezi events. This project offers piecemeal solutions to manageable problems that would help these uh, problems perpetuation. In the spirit of tactical urbanism that rises bottom-up from observation of the local and everyday life situations, the designers carry a field research on the streets of Istanbul. When the researchers look at Istanbul's tactical practices, however, all they seem to notice is the entrepreneurial sp spirit of the street vendors or squatter profiteers. There is no sign of acknowledgement of the long left-wing tradition or its collective memory, for example, in this research which at least partially inspired the Gezi uprising. The designer's project after this research also supports a passive acceptance and this entrepreneurial spirit, which is quite convenient for the neoliberal policies. Rather than criticizing the government's Toki blocks, they provide band-aid solutions to make them livable, and they negotiate with the system rather than aspire a process that would overturn it. The narrative video, um, of the project tells a fictional story, for instance, of a small-scale but successful entrepreneur, Emre Parlak, or Mr. Bright, who lives in a Toki block far from Istanbul city center. Rather than being a victim of his uh, situation, or rather than rebelling against the government's policies, Parlak starts a small business in the settlement, which instantly picks up, soon spreads through the intelligent use of social media and everyday communication technologies, and it inspires other entrepreneurial residents to start similar smaller bus businesses, and eventually these businesses turn the Toki blocks into more social and green environments. And the success story is crowned at the end of the movie,
when Parlak receives a participation award from the municipality. Yes, this is the same municipality that is responsible of Istanbul's demise in the last decade and the same municipality that, that was the target of Gezi events. The tactical urbanism as it comes out of this project is hardly rebellious or critical of the authoritarian rule in Turkey or subversively tactical as a true desertion would have inspired, but it proposes piecemeal steps where the success is measured with a prize from the AK Party government itself. So to me, such examples indicate how much care it actually needs to discuss housing of the commons alerting us to the challenges of global awareness and solidarity. And this brings me to my final question. How might global activism of housing look today? Would it, for instance, be useful to defend that housing should become a human right, to phase out real estate values as the major uh, developers of the cities, and also to prevent opportunistic use of public housing by individual governments, while still making sure that public funds are allocated for affordable housing? Could housing become a common human right, just like common air and rain? So if my talk accomplished anything today, it was to show how urgent, but at the same time difficult, the scope of this aspiration actually is. If there could be ever such a thing as common housing, or if there could indeed be ever such an act as commonizing public spaces, it needs to be alert to its facile and co-opted practices in the past and present, and at the same time, it, needs, it does not need to give up on the use of the state's budget for subsidized housing. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's always a mission art. It's really interesting how it's similar. Mm -hmm. Some of the same patterns in the wrong, you know, mm -hmm. but the only difference is when, uh, in some period, that you don't know which government you have, uh, because we become more established and in a first period of actual In that period, they could. Like lots of engineers and students, they help them to have the infrastructure that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, and city was helping because it was not that uh, established or no yet. Mm -hmm. But after that, they, they, oh, like the same project, like the apartment building, out of nowhere, coming in the places that were not close to them, mm -hmm. even city. And force people to from the locations of that they have the good for villas and things, they move them to that those apartments. Yeah. That is not working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in a way, obviously, as the United Nations reports also um, expose, there are you know, squatter settlements or illegal informal settlements is a big problem around the world. But in a way, we are sometimes uh, forgetting uh, the differences of the land policies in each country and um, putting them all together. So the fact that um, two thirds of the territory belonged to the state and uh, was actually a very big part of the story in Turkey. So I wonder if um, the same was the case in uh, Iran. Yeah, it was a different difference. So it's different. For them, uh, not in the urban area. Other than there is like the tradition if some farmers work in some land, it's, they can cook, uh, use their land for agriculture, but they cannot settle in that land. And mm -hmm. it's not known. There are mm, some parts that is known to government, but not all. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was really uh, 
change their story and how can they can affect it in yeah. the process what they always want to yeah, in Turkey, that definitely is a very integral part of the story that may not be true in other countries. Yeah. Is this just now? I find myself a But maybe is it just part of organism of this and at this point that we should be thinking about how to incorporate it or is this how do you see that as a possible that has existed and there's nothing to do right now? So, um, the turkey blocks? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I like that like over, like, weird yeah, I mean, um, your sentiment is very common. I mean, we just cannot um, assume that the, this history in the last 10 years didn't happen and it's really changed. The numbers are so big and when you go to this town, you don't need the numbers. You uh, you see the whole city uh, has been now shaped. It's a Tokyo city now. Um, and in a way, the sentiment that we should be trying to negotiate with this is the same sentiment of the last project that I mentioned. It's the same sentiment of the tactical urbanism as it is emerging now, uh, which I understand. Uh, I mean, we just kind of assume that these environments are going anywhere soon. Um, but at the same time, um, thinking that it's important to um, correct the and make them better uh, is thinking more critically of uh, the alternatives. So I guess we have to do both while peacefully making it available. Um, Tools, um, but at the same time, when that becomes a blind because tries to overturn, just the same I think to do this thing being a mere piece size. And that's that was my critical question on of the idea of tax urbanism as it has been brought to the system. The same story happened, I think, they very easily crafted to the state and state to get the message of them in quite a few ways. So we have to be able to that. Okay, I think if there's no more questions, we go to our second speaker. Some technical problems, and we are connecting him. Hi, Chitin, can you hear us? Okay, great. Just a second, I'm going to put you on. Okay, now uh, we see you too, and we hear you. So our second speaker is uh, Emre Chetingre. Now he's in Denmark, I guess. Um, he uh, his, his title is Communizing Against Protest Camps, Home Places, and um, Homelessness. And he's a PhD student in philosophy at Villanova. Exactly. Uh, his research interests include radical democracy, urban justice, counter mapping, the colonial theory, and philosophy of space. He holds an MA degree in political science from Walsh University in Istanbul, in Turkey, and philosophy from Villanova uh, in Philadelphia. Now, um, he's with us. 
Um, yeah, listen again. Yes, we can hear you well, I think. from Tahir to Taksim. 
And the Fagelman, uh, Fabian Frenzel, and Patrick McFurley argue in their book that the contemporary uh, protest camps provide types of interaction, exchange, in the sense, all places or two. They establish infrastructures of sleeping, bathing, cooking, etc., while at the same time providing the emotional support, belonging, and security for uh, inbound footwork again, uh, called the nurturing of one's spirit. End quote. If making of such home places in public spaces help protesters on the one hand to stay on site around the globe and continue pursuing their political causes in a more determined fashion, on the other hand, it allows them to prefigure miniature society in the offer alternative regimes of habitation that cut counters the capitalist on a property and consumption. In doing so, protesters for sharing the public spaces with, with those spaces previously inhabitants that are homeless people and move on to shelter them. Uh, and take shelter with them in the same way they desire to square and park. During the Occupy movement in the US, what made to the news regarding the relationship between homeless people and Occupy activists were more the discrepancies, petty crimes, problems arising in between these, these movements. However, Occupy's relation to homeless people had been much more complex than presented. In several Occupy locations, homeless people were effectively um, uh, but were effective already at the choice of Occupy uh, locations. For instance, at Occupy Philadelphia during the Arch Street Church General Assembly, which passed the decision to occupy the work for Plaza, concerns over disturbing homeless population on the Plaza were raised, and a homeless outreach group performed to address the needs and problems of homeless people at the Philly uh, Philadelphia Occupy site. After the initial occupation, the number of homeless people on Occupy sites including Philadelphia grew very, very quickly, arguably thanks to home place infrastructures providing for basic needs. In fact, occupied protests and encampments have become hubs for cities' homeless population. This did cause certain problems on site, enough to address the needs for such growing and diverse populations. In any case, expecting uh, occupied to solve the problems of homelessness, which is a long-standing crisis in the US, and beyond would be unrealistic. According to the 2013 Annual Homeless Assessment Report by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, there were 610,000 approximate uh, homeless people in the US. These include sheltered and unsheltered homeless people. 215,000 approximate uh, people were unsheltered. Uh, this means that they, they sleep in public or private locations that are not designated for, for academic accommodation, such as parks, abandoned buildings, cars, bus or train stations, and, and so forth. And this, these numbers, the annual homeless assessment reports, numbers are the, uh, the low end of the numbers, the very the official numbers. Uh, there are other reports that actually give uh, higher numbers. Needless to say, in that forum, homelessness is one of the severest consequences of the social economic inequalities perpetrated by the current capitalist system and exacerbated through neoliberalism. Its primary causes are poverty, precarity, lack of accessible housing, and social care. Eroding work, work opportunities, underpayment, housing speculation, as well as, in many cases, bankruptcy due to astronomical hospital bills, prepare the conditions for homelessness for many. The cultural capitalist culture of the US right weaves homeless people in, in derogatory ways as losers, public hazards, hobos, implying that they deserve the maltreatment they are subjected to. These views add up to anti homeless policies. Private management and security of public spaces, their anti homeless redesigns are examples of such policies. For instance, seat divisions through vertical slats, tilted benches. Um, even in some cases, five floor starts have become design norms in public space. Those are would have uh, shown some pictures, but I hope you can picture uh, from examples that you have seen already um, all these design features to keep homeless people away from public spaces. Against this uh, infringement of the rights of homeless people, Occupy and Campus try to provide a hospitable space for homeless usage and counter the crisis of homelessness in its miniature uh, refrigerated, refrigerated fashion. The very home place making on public uh, made a significant statement on the crucial but not legally recognized right to habitation. As I mentioned earlier, 
I'd like to highlight three aspects of the protest camp assertion on this track. First of all, home place making at the protest camps addresses the immediate needs of homeless people on site through direct action. Tents, sleeping facilities, meal, basic health care, kitchens, and other social activities were all provided for free that directly give the basic care they were looking for a long time. Following a do-it-yourself ethos, uh, protesters, in collaboration with homeless people, establish and sustain the required infrastructures. Moreover, through commonizing public spaces, which are previously in state or private control, protest camps provide a safer space for homeless people from the constant harassment of security and police. Secondly, Occupy protesters uh, protest camps' commendation was accompanied by a conscious agenda to assert the right to housing and habitation. Its protest agendas include home foreclosures and problems of social economic inequalities. Following the financial crisis uh, in the US uh, of uh, 2007 and 8, the explosion of what is usually referred as the housing bubble caused many families to lose their homes to banks. Uh, approximately 6 million people who lost their jobs after this period, uh, rising the official unemployment rate of US to 9.4%. This in turn devoid people of the ability to pay their loans, and the lost market value of their houses made it impossible for people to cover the loans, even by selling those houses and the other dynamics that led to for uh, home foreclosures. And many of the occupied uh, residents are victims of these practices, uh, and even protesters directed against major actors of foreclosures, such as the banks of Wells Fargo and Chase. The third aspect uh, I'd like to highlight is a more philosophical uh, one that can be referred to as an existential home place making. Homelessness, in fact, is not only a social economic problem, it's a, it exists also in countries with developed social services, less income inequality, and higher living standards, and uh, such as Denmark, which uh, which is not a random choice of example. I was in Denmark uh, for, for quite a while, that's why I'm uh, using this example. But it's also a good example because of, because of uh, social state. In Denmark, according to Housing Rights Watch, uh, Watch support, uh, in 2011, there were 5,000 homeless people, including sheltered and unsheltered uh, homeless people. Uh, considering their population, which is approximately 5 million, uh, 0.1% 0, 0 of its population is homeless, or was homeless in 2011. This is half the percentage size of the homeless population of the US, which is 0.2% uh, of its population. So even the, even the percentage difference is double the amount in the US, but homelessness is never there's a problem in Denmark. In trying to understand, I, I say, first of all, Find Denmark the social state, but it's not like a classist society. It's not a communist state. So, it's, so there are there's still lurking social economic problems um, that would explain some of this problem. Moreover, medical reasons behind homelessness, such as mental problems, alcohol addictions, and so forth, are behind homelessness in Denmark as much as anywhere else. But on top of these factors, there is what uh, Previn Brand, a Danish psychiatrist and expert, and, and then an expert on homelessness, called existential homelessness. And I really found, found this concept very interesting. In his talk entitled Those We Cannot Reach at the Conference for General, Pra General Practitioners in Copenhagen, January 2015, he argues that homelessness is mostly existential uh, in Denmark. That, that is to say, it is about an, yes, an inability to settle down somewhere, like a feeling of longing and community. I found this statement quite too interesting uh, because of uh, certain existential thinkers in having, having those existential thinkers in mind, uh, them viewing homelessness as an existential condition of human beings. Hannah Arendt, for instance, takes this Nietzschean perspective on existence as, as her uh, basis. While advocating for a political remedy of this homelessness, she argues that through the constitution of, of what she called polis, uh, referring to a Greek, Greek uh, city state, that is to say, a political realm in which equal political actors can participate, appear, and assert themselves in the world, 
uh, using an iron to all in time knowledge. The existential burden of homelessness can be ameliorated. For the Nagila, political action for Iran fulfills the role of uh, art uh, that, that uh, no, fulfills the, the role art plays for Nietzsche, which is building a home in the existentially alienated world. Inspired from this philosophical view of political action, facilitating to over, over, overcome existential homelessness, I found it plausible, albeit more speculative, to suggest that colonizing at protest camp home places offers a further assertion for the right to inhabitation. This time on an existential level. It helps participants to appropriate a public space as they work for making a home place, identifying with that place, and, and with the community in resistance. Collective political action, especially commonizing as protest camp home place making, helps people appropriate the space as home without re reducing that space into commodified property relations. This, I think, explains why in Madrid, as Plaza del Sol, as Alvaro Sanzila Butrago conveys, one of the most recurring slogans were this square is our home. Just to sum up, I suggested in the paper that in all these three aspects, direct action that sheltering homeless people, protest agenda against the crisis of homelessness, and political action remedying existential homelessness, protests can assert and enact a crucial right, a right to housing and habitation. In doing so, I do not need to limit the political practices of communization to a politics of, of rights, which can be confined to the address uh, legal framework. In fact, I view communication as an enactment of constituting political power that underlines institutionalized framework, frameworks. And yet, institutionalized and institutionalizing powers interact in dialectic discussion. And I see a practical value in pursuing, especially Henry Lefeb and Don Michel's discourse of rights. The right to, to habitation is especially an urgent right, constantly infringed upon by neoliberal urbanization and its lack of application negatively affect millions around the world. The protest camp communication asserts and enacts this crucial right, albeit only in miniature. And hence, it's important uh, to take these miniature enactments uh, seriously, while at the same time expanding upon them and addressing the crisis of homelessness in modern and structural ways. Thank you very much. This is my paper. Thank you. Thanks, Chetan, for your presentation. Uh, are there any questions to him? Okay, you, you can hear me, but. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I can repeat the question to him. Okay. Yes. Um, I can only hear you, John. Okay. One thing is uh, about the um, that landmark that you said that there is 5,000 homelesses. Uh, can, can you hear her? No, I can't. I mean, I, I, I can't hear her clearly. Okay. I can hear that she's speaking, oh, yeah. Helen's speaking, but I can't hear her clearly. I can't understand uh, the question. About the Dan Denmark that you said that is 5,000 um, homelesses, um, it's uh, like it's in an urban area and it's like um, uh, how they, I didn't get the like uh, how it's not a problem there, but in the U.S. Uh, mm. it's a problem. How, like what's the difference? I didn't get the point that... Okay, so yeah, maybe it wasn't clear. Well, the, the, the reason that I chose this uh, example of Denmark was because they have a very strong social state and a very strong social support uh, for, uh, for the people living there. Um, at least so that they are citizens and legal legal uh, aliens. So that that also, of course, the, the question of uh, legal uh, immigrants that, uh, and the, the, the kind of treatments there. But the reason that I, I chose Denmark as an example was was the, the persistence of the of the problem of homelessness in a country that has uh, far less income income inequality comparing to uh, United States uh, and uh, a great a significant um, uh, amount of social support to people who are in need. For instance, their health care is for free, like as a, as a uh, striking contrast to, to United States. Uh, they, um, they have 
uh, designated houses uh, much, much uh, broadly uh, and effectively to people who are not able to afford uh, 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 a home. In fact, the 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 down in 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 what the 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 bad pay certain citizenship payments uh, in case of. Uh, of uh, following a certain uh, being unemployed in unemployment uh, payments and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the social state in Denmark uh, overall is much more powerful than the than US and, and still they're suffering from this, this problem of, of homelessness. That's, so that's part of the reason why I chose this example. And I was referring to this Danish doctor's uh, presentation who who thinks, I mean this can be discussed differently, who thinks the, the homelessness is an existential problem in Denmark because he thinks like a person can actually, uh, even though they're coming from a, a, a poor background or in, even mentally uh, unhealthy, they uh, wouldn't fall um, so deep as someone would fall in the United States because the social state would somehow pull them up. Uh, so he was arguing that that the. Homelessness actually is existential, and that was a that, that's something I just wanted to kind of throw into um, um, in connection with some some philosophers. So I don't I don't know if this is this is clear. Um, and in terms of numbers, it's a very small country, five million people, and in five million people they have five thousand homeless people. Um, and percentage-wise, the, the the homelessness homeless people. Uh, is not that much different from the U.S. That's a, that's what actually ended up striking me. Um, fact that uh, 0.2 percent of uh, of the population of the U.S. is is of course is uh, falls into this category of homelessness, while 0.1 percent of the population of Denmark falls. So, percentage-wise, um, it is. Twice as big in the US, but still not uh, as big as the difference between uh, the, the, the income equality for it. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sense. yeah, yeah I, partially yes. But the concentration of homelessness, uh, homelessness in the US, in some urban area, it's like uneven mm -hmm. distribution of the homelessness. Uh, does it uh, like make the percentage uh, uh, works for population in total, but uh, but uh, in like I think this is something to consider. But one thing that uh, you had in your uh, and I want to know what you think about is right of the people to the place to the public place that as a choice can they uh, choose to stay at. Uh, street on the uh, be, like to sleep at the street as mm -hmm. uh, and they have do they have the right on that uh, or they have to evacuate them like in absolutely no, I, think, here. Uh, yeah. I mean I think they, they absolutely have the right to, to public space I mean the, the definition of public space is a space that uh, allows the access of, of all uh, and hence, everyone has to, to have and uh, and then, and then uh, have a right to use those spaces. This is absolutely the, the case. I, I think what I what I uh, didn't touch upon here much, but I was uh, the colonialized is the, the loss of public spaces, uh, which would be uh, a certain kind of design, a certain kind of management, um, uh, and change of ownership of, of such spaces, so that homeless people. Or many other people actually. It's not just homeless people, but usually those spaces are transformed into uh, uh, spaces that that are like more cons consumption spaces, so to say. So instead of being public spaces, they become more like consumer space that only uh, a certain population, a population of, of buyers, can can use. So that's actually a very a significant loss of uh, of an urban environment, and hence. Um, the public spaces have to be have to be uh, protected. The, 
the right to stay in, the, in, a, in a public space, but with the right to live, um, it's not, I mean, there are also people who are um, choosing that as a lifestyle and having kind of coming from a certain privilege to have that choice, and I totally respect that, and I think it should completely be open to that. Um, or, but on top of that, or besides, besides that, uh, homelessness, um, I, I, I do see homelessness as a, as a, as a crisis, as a, as a problem, that uh, most people uh, who would prefer to have a home are not able to, to have that, that they um, are not able to um, afford uh, those uh, high prices of homes, um, or lost their fortune, or like several different reasons behind it, and then end up staying in public spaces. So it's not that it's not it's staying in public spaces for uh, permanently. It doesn't really seem to be a solution to me. But what I what I tend to criticize is the the way uh, that those public spaces are managed, and then the problem itself, the problem of homelessness itself, is not solved, but only deferred and and dislocated and, and to other locations. So, it, especially we see these like city and city centers that um, are gentrifying. So, are either privatized or started to be privately managed. Um, and uh, homeless populations and state borders and um, uh, uh, certain group of non um, profitable, uh, non middle, middle class, middle and high class uh, groups are um, sent away from the city. So these are all problems that are um, extremely related to public spaces. Um, and if, yeah, definitely, again, we emphasize uh, there is absolutely a right to access public, access public spaces and use them um, and also, also for sleeping. Thank you. Okay. Are there further questions? Any questions? Um, Any questions coming? Hello. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on um, Heather Rand? Because I'm not familiar with her stuff on like the homelessness situation, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I think I got the first part and the last part of the sentence. And, and please correct me um, if I miss anything. You said I want, you asked me to elaborate more on Hannah Arendt's yes. uh, right, conception of existential um, homelessness and sources, but right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, she, she's an existential political thinker um, that uh, draws a lot from, from Nietzsche and also some of the controversial figures like Heidegger. Who have this this view on existence very briefly that existence itself doesn't have any meaning, um, but it is actually um, meaningless and hostile to human being. So, it, so, uh, and they characterize this as this existential homelessness. So, if human beings are homeless uh, in the world, and and for Nietzsche, for instance, art is a way of making home out of this. Uh, existential homelessness of human beings. So this is the condition of, of human. For on, on our end, it is politics. Uh, the, the way to make home from within um, this existential homelessness is, is politics. And she has a very specific kind of uh, understanding of politics that uh, pertains to direct uh, or democracy, um, uh, direct action and, and performative action, which uh, would Take so much time to, to, to delve into them right now. But uh, her idea is to, to create a certain political realm among equals that uh, allow people to, um, in her terms, experience freedom. Because freedom can only be experienced in the public, public uh, realm. And by virtue of establishing such kind of things, which in my lifetime, the closest thing that I've ever seen was, was the protest camps um, in Gezi in, uh, and in Philadelphia. And in New York, that's all these general assemblies and direct democratic, democratic practices, and also a, a, a build, building of a political community around those uh, squares and parks. Um, that's why I thought um, it is very close to Hunter's understanding of, of the remedy of existential homelessness 
uh, those public spaces, those uh, direct democratic political uh, uh, practices. So I don't know if, if this clarifies a little bit. Um, and if there is something very specific that you'd like to you'd like me to address, I can also. It was a great it. answer. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Everyone loved it. Okay, now, another you. question. For uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you were um, with us when um, during my presentation, uh, but I thought that our presentations made uh, a nice couple in the sense that uh, it, it might be interesting to think how homelessness is less of an issue in Turkey because of said homeless. I mean, in a way, um, squatting um, takes care of that issue if you want to put it mm -hmm. that way. But the history of squatting settlements in uh, Turkey has shown that it, they have been really cooperative the system, and so that was my argument. Um, so you mentioned when you were um, answering a question that street sleeping is not necessarily uh, um, a solution for you because it actually displaces or delays uh, the problem of housing rather than solves it. Uh, and I was wondering uh, how um, you think the protest camps um, is a sustainable uh, solution uh, to housing, given that they are also uh, vulnerable and temporary. So I wonder if um, commonizing protest camps for homemaking, do you think that that also delays uh, the solution rather than uh, really confronts it in a yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great question. Well, I, I don't really think protest camps uh, um, completely solve this problem. So it, it is, I do agree uh, also the observation that they are not sustainable. They, they tend to, uh, they're multiple and they, they tend to be evicted, which can happen. The, the reason that I look at, look at protest camps are, be, are uh, because they do, I think, change the discussion um, in a very um, important way. It brings uh, certain issues that are tend to be uh, sidelined onto on the agenda, and it, it is um, one way of. Uh, it's a very very significant um, center of mobilization that um, that brought brought political communities, political um, mobilization. Um, to the front, that is uh, where I kind of see the more um, uh, more sustainable, more long-term um, solving of those problems uh, would lie. Um, so I don't know if it addresses uh, your concerns in, in in that sense, but I, uh, it, it is important for instance not not to. Um, overestimate what to expect from those protest camps and the mobilizations around them. But it's at the same time, I think, very significant to kind of uh, take them seriously and see what what statements were enacted and what, what statements were uh, were, were uh, uh, asserted on those camps uh, in, and in which ways and what we can learn from them and what and what we can implement further um, uh, from them. Uh, so that's that's how, how I think about protest scams. I I wish I was able to listen to all of your presentation. I, I'm so sorry that I missed it just because of the technical problems. I guess. I'll send it to you. I would love to go through it and listen it. Um, I, yeah, I guess these technical problems are inevitable when we have so much mediation um, going on in between. Uh, and I, it is a very interesting actually statement about squatting. Uh, uh, the, the 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 lack of the lack the um, the problem of homelessness is not as, as serious as uh, it, it, it is in the U.S. and because of the squat that's that's a very um, I think it's a very true statement. Um, yeah, it's um, but thank you so much for the question. I, I don't know if, if it really addressed your your concern about what this camp is being unsustainable and deferring the problem of homelessness. Um, was it clear or should yes, I? Yes, it was. I, I mean, in a way, uh, there is no good answer to any of these um, to the, to this question, um, and so 
thinking about the protest camp as one of the incomplete but um, but still suggestive answers is I think uh, what I got from your answer. Yep. If there are no further questions, I'd like to close the session. I th thank our speakers. Thank you, Ezra, and thank you, Chitu. And I'd like to thank you for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.